Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Mika, for the kind introduction. Thanks for having me. So do we have my slides? Um, I am part of a small group that started something called the Rolling Jubilee. We launched it back in the fall of 2012. Few people realize that their personal debts are for sale on shady speculative secondary debt markets. Uh, they're bundled in por portfolios and sold for pennies on the dollar. And what the Rolling Jubilee does is we buy those portfolios of debt, just like debt collectors do. But instead of trying to extract the full amount from people, we abolish them. We have uh, actually erased over $30 million of healthcare and educational debt to date. Uh, with more to come. And the question is, why did we do this? Why did we erase the debts of thousands of strangers? As my collaborator Thomas Gilkey likes to say, the Rolling Jubilee challenges the phony morality around debt. The idea that debts always have to be repaid, because this isn't true. Companies and the people they make rich walk away from their debts all the time, thanks to bankruptcy proceedings or government bailouts. What's more, the Rolling Jubilee is founded on the premise that the debts we erase are illegitimate and immoral to begin with. We don't believe anyone should have to go into debt because they want to go to college or because they get cancer. And as with any unjust, thank you. And as with any unjust social uh, arrangement, we have to strip certain debts of their legitimacy in the public mind before we can dissolve their power over us. And that's what the Rolling Jubilee is designed to do, to make the case that any debts incurred simply to secure the basic necessities of life are odious. Thank you. Uh, our latest initiative, the Debt Collective, is a kind of uh, tech-savvy 21st century debtors union. And what we're doing is we're trying to turn this moral argument into direct action and hopefully concrete wins. For me, this journey started back in the early days of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, it was the second or third day of the occupation of Zuccotti Park, and I heard this young man shouting out in the voice of a carnival barker, step right up and write down what you're worth to the 1%. And this young woman is in front of me, she stepped up and she wrote down $120,000 of college debt. And this older woman walked up and she wrote down tens of thousands of dollars of medical bills. And I walked up and I wrote down $45,000 in student loans. And I was really struck by the power of this collective confession, which anticipated that we are the 99% Tumblr that went viral soon afterwards. And at the time I was working on the book Mika mentioned, um, <clears throat> it's a book about why the digital revolution hasn't had the democratizing impact so many predicted. And Occupy left an indelible mark on my book, on both the argument and the title, because the people's platform is kind of an homage to the people's microphone. But part of what I argue in the people's platform is that the digital revolution is inseparable from the political and financial revolution that has been unfolding since the 1970s, which is more rewards for those at the top and more economic insecurity and risk for everybody else. In other words, the internet is inseparable from the economic system Occupy was rightly railing against. And it's a system with different names, right? Neoliberalism, post-Fordism, optimistically, sometimes people say late capitalism. It's the system embodied by Matt Tybee's giant vampire squid. His unforgettable image of Goldman Sachs, and I quote, wrapped around the face of humanity, relentlessly jamming its blood funnel into anything that smells like money. Over the last 40 years under the system, social provisions have been all but gutted. Wages have stagnated, partly due to the fact that traditional trade unions, unions are in a seemingly irreversible death spiral. And easy access to credit has created the illusion that prosperity is being broadly shared. We've moved from a welfare state to a debt fair state. And the Debt Collective aims to reverse this trend by transforming indebtedness into a source of political power and economic leverage for the indebted. If everybody, if all of us, would step right up and write down what we're worth to the 1%, it would turn out that we are worth an awful lot. Individually, the average 2015 college graduate borrower owes $35,000, which is an overwhelming sum for one person. But collectively, Americans owe $1.3 trillion of student debt. And the Debt Collective sees that $1.3 trillion as leverage. Leverage not necessarily to overwhelm the system, but to transform it to make it more equitable and humane. Debtors, however, 
don't recognize their collective economic power, we're isolated and we're ashamed. And that's why our slogan from the very beginning of the Jubilee has been, you are not alone. So the Debt Collective's current campaign aims to bring this slogan to life and is doing that. We are organizing with a growing group of student debtors, nearly all of whom we connected with initially online, uh, who attended a giant for-profit college chain called Corinthian Colleges Incorporated, which served over 110,000 people across the country at its peak. It was massive. Corinthian has been the target of numerous state and federal investigations. It's been sued for running a predatory lending scheme. Like other for-profit colleges, Corinthian was notorious for targeting low-income minorities, single mothers, veterans, uh, and targeting them with high-pressure, misleading recruitment techniques, all while slurping up squid-like billions and billions of dollars of federal student aid. To protest the mess that they're in and the fact that they are drowning in debt for what are literally worthless credits and degrees, 15 former Corinthian students declared the first student debt strike in history back in February. The debt strikers are demanding the Department of Education issue a blanket discharge of their debt and the debts of the other 500,000 people who attended this scam school. On the grounds they were defrauded, but also on the grounds that education is a right and a public good. Since the strike began, the Corinthian 15, as they are originally called, have seen their numbers explode to almost 200. And by taking this bold action of saying, no, we can't pay, we won't pay, and we shouldn't have to pay because these debts are illegitimate and immoral, the Debt Collective's pilot campaign has grabbed headlines and endorsements, endorsements from the New York Times editorial board, uh, the American Federation of Teachers, from Congress people, et cetera. Uh, we were invited to Washington to meet with government officials. So this is a problem that the government wanted to sweep under the rug, that the Department of Education created but didn't want to deal with. And now, thanks to our organizing and to the bravery of these debt strikers, they can't do that any longer. Though the Debt Collective is a new initiative and our current campaign is ongoing, we have already learned valuable lessons, some of which I want to share with you here in closing. Lessons as we continue to attempt to reverse engineer the vampire squid. So the first is look forward, not back. We need new structures and new tactics for a new age. The good old days of uh, strong trade unions are gone, and those days weren't that good for lots of people anyway. The Debt Collective is tailor-made to our networked, mobile, precarious, financialized age. Debt sticks to people no matter where they are, whether they are employed or unemployed. You don't need to share a factory floor to be mobilized around debt. The distinction between offline and online organizing is false. So yes, you uh, don't need to share a factory floor to be mobilized around debt, and that's great. But the problem is then that debtors are dispersed and they're hard to find. We have connected with thousands of disgruntled Corinthian students and debtors in general um, <clears throat> online, mainly on Facebook. But the real interpersonal and strategic advances have come from meeting face to face. So it's not either or, real or virtual, but both. Facebook sucks, but it's still unavoidable. Facebook is where the people are, uh, but I just want to give you one example uh, of why it sinks. Basically, former Corinthian students are constantly being targeted by financial scammers offering phony loan consolidation schemes and other uh, fraudulent services on Facebook. And these scam ads made it that much harder for debt collective organizers to build the trust of former Corinthian students because they assumed that we were hucksters too. And it's just a reminder that advertisers and not activists are Facebook's true customers. And if you're interested in reading more of that, I actually have a story that touches on this incident in, the, in a new issue of The Nation, I guess, edited on technology and inequality. Depth, not breadth. In a digital age, we're all obsessed with metrics, whether we're advertisers or activists, and I think this really leads us astray. The Corinthian student debt strike began with 15 brave and committed individuals, and there's no doubt in my mind that they got more traction and have inspired more people and inspired more fear in certain circles than a petition with a million signatures would have. A small, committed, and well-organized group in it for the long haul is infinitely more valuable than a viral flash in the pan. Organizing matters. <clears throat> so if you want to be in it for the long haul, you need organizers and you need organizations. None of the work I've described would be possible without a small, intensely devoted volunteer team, in particular Laura Hanna, who is somewhere in this room, raise your hand, and who has been, uh, been at the helm of this. 
Um, and I also want to shout out to Ann Larson. She's been at the helm of this whole enterprise. Today, we like to imagine our social movements as horizontal, spontaneous, and leaderless. But this romantic image obscures the labor of people behind the scenes who are keeping momentum, building momentum, strategizing, keeping everything going. Our movements would be more robust and effective if we would admit the crucial way orga role organizers play and, to build, uh, and if we would support organizations to support the organizers. Debt resistance includes you. Even if you are not individually in the, in the red, <clears throat> you and your community are affected by the vicious cycle of austerity and indebtedness. A more cooperative, non-extractive economy would benefit all of us, but we can't expect those at the bottom of a punishing system to, the, to do the hard work of bringing change about. I'm happy to say that we have exciting news on this front. Today we are announcing that over 1,200 people, uh, 1,200 former students from a variety of schools, not just for-profits, but also public universities and elite private schools, have announced that they are ready to strike their own loans in solidarity with Corinthian students if the Department of Education fails to issue a blanket discharge and do what's right. This is the kind of solidarity we need a lot more of. Thank you. This is the kind of solidarity we need a lot more of if we're going to challenge the status quo. Challenging the status quo, transforming the entire economy, is a very big ambition. We're well aware of that. Uh, we also believe that it needs to happen. The fight we're in now isn't just about Corinthian. It isn't just about the for-profit college sector, however corrupt it is. It's about an entire generation that has been forced to mortgage their futures to get an education only to discover that their degrees are worthless, there are no jobs, and their debts are unpayable. This is about a tiny majority of the population who holds the majority of society's wealth and our government's inability to protect its people from rent extractors. It's about the myriad ways extreme inequality undermines democracy. Under such conditions, the refusal to pay back certain debts is a defensible act of civil disobedience. For those aiming to make a more just society, this refusal may be nothing less than a responsibility. Thank you.